Das ist Yeah. 
try something new here. Oh boy. I can be singing, don't worry. <laughs> Ten minutes or less, all right? There we go. Count, count down and start. So, let's see. Ladies' night, June 28th at 6.30 p.m. at Whole Seafood on Granada. If you would like to know more information, Sandy, where are you at? Raise your hand, Miss Sandy. All right, there's one announcement, 24 seconds in. All right, so tomorrow, Sunday, right? Take it easy. We don't have anything really planned tomorrow, so just chill, relax, because next week is packed. So get your wind down, pace yourself, because once next week starts, well, you're gonna need some. You're gonna need some energy. So, however, 6 p.m. tomorrow. What happens tomorrow at 6 p.m. right here? Recovery. Recovery meeting. I love the enthusiasm. All right. Love the enthusiasm. All right. Monday at 7 p.m. What happens? Men's group happens. Right. So we'll open up the doors at 6:30. That way we can come in, men only, sorry ladies, and and uh, so 6.30 we get to fellowship a little bit, but 7 o'clock the men's group starts, right? This is session 3 of 8, okay? So if you missed the first two, don't sweat it, you can come in and get three. If you can only make the first three, that's fine, don't sweat it, the important thing is, is, is come here, okay? So the men's group... The first session was, it, well, first off, the series is called Who Has Your Six? And the very first session was Fire Team. The second session's title was Support. And the third session, this session coming up this Monday at what time? Seven. Seven is Accountability. Okay, Accountability. And I put a little subtitle called Never Leave Your Wingman, right? Because, you, you know, the whole idea behind this series is they're taking parts from various dude flicks, right? Uh, Forrest Gump, uh, We Were Soldiers. This series, Session 3, Series 3, is Top Gun. Not that new Top Gun stuff. The vintage Top Gun. The Top Gun that we... As people over 40 probably know, <laughs> love, and, and enjoy. So, uh, what's going on there? Sorry. Joe. Uh, <laughs> turn it down. All right. So, um, yeah, and now you got me all jacked up, and you just cost me probably like 30 seconds on the count on the clock. <laughs> That's all right, though. I have to give you. Top gun. Top gun. There we are. So, Top Gun, accountability, not leaving your wingman. Uh, it's going to be an amazing series. So if you haven't been yet, uh, come and also bring a friend. Okay? I can guarantee you will not be disappointed. So, uh, Wednesdays. What happens Wednesdays? Ladies. Is there any food for the ladies? No. no food. What time does it start? Seven. Seven. Thursday, what, what, what's going down? Bible study. Uh, is there food? Yes. Absolutely. What time did the doors open? 6.30. All right. 6.30. Maybe 6 if Joe's here. All right. Uh, so that kind of wraps up next week. Going into the weekend, right? Saturday, June 29th at 10.30, we're going to meet at Willie's Tropical Tattoos, Okay. And at 10.45, we're going to do kickstands up, and we're going to ride to the Barracks of Hope, okay? And there's about 30 veterans at the Barracks of Hope right here in town. Uh, a bait has purchased food. I think they got barbecue and a bunch of other stuff going on. But we're going to ride over there. We're going to support them during uh, the pre-4th of July festivities. Uh, there's going to be a little... Uh, like I said, food. I think Frankie's going to do a, a, a lesson, uh, probably condensed, but nonetheless, there's going to be a lesson there. So, um, anyways, please put that on your calendar if you're looking for something to do on Saturday. 
And then, of course, we have church service here on Saturday evening. But Sunday, what's happening on Sunday, Ed? Yeah, there's a few people are getting baptized. Woohoo! The whole Bedell family is getting baptized, right? And then we got Roadblock. You're getting baptized. Anybody else getting baptized? Anybody else? Frankie, we're, we're getting wet, right? All right. So if if you been want to get baptized or you know somebody that's been talking about it or that, that conversation um, bubbles up to the service this week, um, please, by all means, tell them to put their swimsuit on. Um, grab a towel and come out to Sunsplash Park. So it's going to happen at 9 o'clock, okay? 9 o'clock in the morning and uh, at Sunsplash Park, we'll all meet there and, and do the deal. So that's it for Sunday. Uh, Independence Day is on Thursday. And that's pretty much about it for all the big request, or big announcements. And then we'll go into the typical announcements. So you have prayer requests. If you have somebody that's in need of prayer, at each table there's a writing utensil, sound like a teacher, um, there's some paper, and um, please feel free to write down your prayer request, and you can take it to the back bar, you can put it out there in the foyer inside that little wood treasure chest, and Jen will grab it, and then we'll pray at the end of church service, and then the prayer team will cover it later as well, okay? Uh, tithe donations, we'd like to pay the light bill and firework bill. And, uh, but anyways, if you guys want to do some donations, by all means, uh, in the back there's some receptacles. We have um, a gas tank out there and a foyer. Again, foyer happening spot out there. Um, huh, speaking of the foyer, if you're new here and you, or you're an old timer here, but you have yet to sign our wall, by all means, please go out there, grab a marker, sign your wall, anywhere but up here, uh, feel free to leave your mark. And the last thing I got, let's see here. So we're seven minutes in, seven minutes in. Uh, so I did a post talking about a, a weapons class, right? So uh, I have a little bit of experience um, teaching uh, firearms for about 21 years uh, in the Army. And I've also um, take. I just recently took a, an NRA class, and I'll take some other classes, get up to speed with some of the new technologies. But I thought it would be a really good thing because I know there's a lot of people here that perhaps endorse and embrace and love the Second Amendment as Woo! I do. Yeah! And, um, you know, so we're going to do a class at the end of July, July 27th, on a Saturday. Um, and it's on Facebook, if you, but if you want to know more about it, just come talk to me uh, after church. I'll give you all the information. But uh, in the morning, it's going to be a four-hour class focused on pistols. And you can bring your, your incursion, bring your uh, firearm here. We will just make sure they're cleared before you walk into the building because we want you to train with your weapon, okay? You guys good? Yeah. I need to take a break. Missy? Y y'all good? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> we love you, Drifter. Um, so in the morning, it's going to be a four-hour class focused on pistols. And in the afternoon, it's going to be focused on rifles, okay? And, you know, we, we have, like, the gas style, the semi-automatic, not automatic. Um, and then also bolt action and lever action, but the, the most the majority of it's gonna be focused on gas operated semi-automatic rifles in the afternoon. And then the following week, we have some range time uh, slotted, and you know that'll be a uh, you know a little bit more information as the class goes on. We'll unpack that later. But anyways, put it on your schedule, July 27th morning, four hours pistol. Afternoon, four hours, and you can stay for the whole day. It's going to be a good time. I can guarantee you're going to learn something. And uh, I just want to save your life or save somebody else's life. So, nine minutes, 28 seconds Woo! left. With that said, do me a favor. Look to your left, right, front, back. Give your neighbors a howdy head, not a handshake, a fist bump. Welcome to Redemption Community Biker Church. We're glad y'all here. Love you. Nine minutes, 45 seconds.
Thank you. 
I usually try to share a little bit about how we find these songs and how we pick these songs. And I know everybody's going through some things they talk about what we got here, but you know, I was thinking about how chains are broken, right? How it happens, and, and it just does, right? And what I realized is just like this song's about to say, there's power in the name of Jesus. That's where the power rests, right? So we use that name and we break the chains. He breaks the chains. Um, so, you know, we just want to have some fun with this a little bit and worship hard. I know we weren't during, during rehearsal tonight, so I'm sure we'll do the same thing because God's at work here. So. <laughs> There is 
immediately comes back out, looks at the producer in the eye, drops the gun on the table, and leaves without saying a word. Next up is a Navy seaman. The order's given, I think her name was Joe. The order's given. <laughs> and, and she comes back out with a disgusted look on her face. And she said, I signed up for college not to kill helpless people. I'm out of here. Right? And she walked away. Following the seaman is a soldier from the army. Now, after hearing the mission, the soldier responds enthusiastically. He grabs the gun and he heads into the room. But after only a few moments, he comes back out and he throws the gun down on the table on fire. He looks at the producer and says, I can't shoot an unarmed man who's just sitting there. I'm out too. By this time, the producer's getting worried about his show. He doesn't think it's going to be made. So his last hope is in a Marine. He knows, yeah, he knows the Marines have a reputation for not being very smart. So he's not. Hey, hey, I just, I just call him like it is, right? And, and so he's not real hopeful that things are going to work out. But the Marine walks in and he's given the order. The producer says, you need to kill whoever's sitting in that room. Can you do that? The Marine responds with a nod, quickly picks up the pistol, and walks in. And before the door even closes, the producer hears multiple clips coming from the church. Right? But then after a brief silence, he hears a loud crackling sound followed by a blood-curdling scream. The Marine walks out holding a table leg covered in blood. Terrified, the producer frantically asks the Marine, what happened? He tosses the pistol down, looks him right in the eye, and says, the gun didn't fire, sir, so I had to improvise. Mission accomplished. <laughs> and only a biker church will you hear Joe playing. <laughs> All right, so last week we explored a topic that I really have no business teaching about, right? And that topic was wisdom. But fortunately, we didn't rely on my wisdom. Be quiet, Bobby. Right? Our lesson instead was based on biblical wisdom. And we said that wisdom, for the most part, comes with age. Right? Because for many of us, it's only after we have experienced things ourselves, sometimes multiple times, that we will retain any wisdom from them. Right? I've had to learn things over and over again. We said that unfortunately we learned many things the hard way. And I gave you a few examples of this. I told you about a story how I learned the importance of safety glasses while cleaning a carburetor, right? <laughs> I also shared with you an example of how many welders learn hard lessons about flash burn from not wearing their mask. After that, I told you about some of the lessons I've learned motorcycle riding and how many of then we're learned the hard way, right? Like riding in the word rain. We talked about how pain and suffering are great teachers, aren't they? But the main idea behind our teaching was for us to learn things from the wisdom of the scriptures without having to experience the pain and suffering associated with sin or bad decisions before we learn things the hard way. That's the idea. And if you remember, I gave you a bunch of scripture that teach us great life lessons. Wisdom that's there for the taking if we would just read it. I shared with you that I've personally chosen to follow the lessons of scripture because I've learned through experience that my ability to make wise choices is flawed. And chances are so is yours. So instead of listening to what my natural instincts tell me to do or what my body tells me feels good, I've chosen instead to follow the scripture. And I explained to you that I've made this choice because unlike me, scripture has been right 100% of the time. And I told you that if I had just read these things and applied them to my life early on, I could have avoided all kinds of trouble. I could have saved myself so much pain, so much grief, so much anxiety. But you know, many of us don't follow the lessons we've learned or we've heard from Scripture because we think we know better, right? We think that we can tell when we're getting close to the danger zone. Even 
know, time after time after time, we cross that threshold and make stupid mistakes, right? I shouldn't say mistakes. Stupid choices. There's a difference. And then I shared another personal example with you about how I learned a difficult lesson about avoiding immoral women. And after sharing that example, I showed you the instructions in the scriptures that could have helped me to easily avoid the absolute destruction that happened in my life because of immoral women. So after we went through all of this, I challenged you to read a chapter of Proverbs every single day. Because every verse I shared with you last week came directly from the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is filled with so many great lessons, you guys. Things that can keep us from making decisions that will harm us. There are financial lessons, lessons on marriage, business lessons, spiritual lessons, relationship lessons, work lessons, lessons about having a peaceful life. There are even political lessons. Again, all there for the taking, if we would just read them. Now, what's cool is this week some of you have been messaging me or texting me, letting me know you're following through with that challenge. Hey, I read that one today. And folks, that's awesome. Keep that up. I promise you the lessons we learned from this book are some of the best advices or pieces of advice, that's not worth it, we will ever receive from anyone or anything. The lessons in Proverbs are very useful tools that will give you wisdom about having to experience the negative consequences of bad decisions. But whether or not we use these tools are up to us. But this week, next slide. There we go. This week, we're on to a new topic. And it's something, again, that I have never taught about before. And honestly, it's something I never even realized could be a topic that we could teach about in church. But you know what? I'm done being surprised by how God puts these lessons together. Amen. Now I just go with it, right? He gives me something, I'm like, okay, if you say so. Even if I don't understand how he's going to develop the topic before I sit down at the keyboard, I just put my hands on the keys, push forward, and watch him work. It's pretty cool. It's, it's a process that I get to be a part of. Anyway, tonight we're going to talk about budgeting. Budgeting. And there's some of you who are going, why did I come tonight? <laughs> Just hang with me, okay? Trust me. It's going to be, uh, put your hand down. We're going to have some fun, all right? As I just said, I had no idea how this was going to come together as a lesson when I began typing it. But as you'll see, it's a lesson that's very applicable to how we live our lives. Does anyone in here have a written budget that they work? A budget on paper or a spreadsheet, it doesn't matter. Anybody? Like three people, four people, five? Okay, good. I'm talking about something that takes all your earnings, when I say budget, subtracts your debts, and gives a very small amount of money at the end, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? All right. So I remember when I was younger, I don't know about you, but I never used a budget. It was easy to keep track of things because, first of all, I didn't have a lot of money, right? But secondly, I only used cash. My paycheck went into my account. It was a simple process. It went into my account. I took enough out for what I needed for the next two weeks. Most of the time, it was almost all of it. But I always left just a little bit in the account so I didn't overdraft it, right? And that was it. That was it. I didn't have to reconcile a checkbook. I didn't have to keep an eye on my bank statements. I didn't throw a table across the room. I didn't have to do anything, right? I didn't have to always keep it on my account to make sure there was enough money in there. It was a piece of cake. Anybody still do that? Yep. One person. Good job. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh. Um, but listen, even back then, even back then, with my limited knowledge, I still had a little bit of understanding about budgeting. I knew that if I was going to have money to eat 
for the next two weeks, I couldn't go out the first night and blow all the cash, right? You figure that out pretty quickly. You do it once and you're screwed, right? Even with that limited amount of knowledge of the financial world, I understood that I needed to use what I had sparingly so that I would have some money for later. Something funny I remember from the military was that after we all got paid, you wouldn't hardly see anybody at the dining facility, right? Or as the Army and the Marines call it, the chow hall, right? You, you, you wouldn't see anybody at the, the mess hall at the beginning of the pay period except the guys who bought vehicles they couldn't afford, <laughs> right? You guys know what I'm talking about. That's so true. That was so true it hurts, right? They're always eating at the chow hall, right? Asking you if you want them to take you somewhere if they get some gas money, right? But then slowly, as it got closer to the next pay period, you'd start to see it fill up as everybody ran out of money, right? But listen, whether it's with money, groceries, gas, shop supplies, over time we've all learned the importance of budgeting. We learn that if we're going to have enough of whatever it is that we need, when we need it, we must conserve and budget our resources, right? Yep. Everybody agree? Yep. And folks, that includes time. Time. Of all the resources we have, time might just be the most valuable resource in our possession. Mm -hmm. You know, to be transparent with you, I don't think we look at the value of time the way we really should. So to help us realize its importance, I'm going to give you a comparison that helps to put it in the right perspective, okay? Let's say we all go on an ocean cruise together. Navy, okay. don't worry, not that cruise, okay? We're gonna go through, time to take your medicine. We're gonna go on an ocean cruise together and it's, and it's sponsored by Harley, right? Take your medicine. Carnival and Harley have partnered together for a biker cruise, Yeah. okay? They have bike shows for entertainment. They sell parts and motorcycle clothes at the gift shop, right? The buffets are filled with bar food, right? It could happen, it could happen. Anyway, we're all on the ship together having a great time. When all of a sudden the ship rams into another ship and begins to break apart. We all run to the lifeboats. It's not a real sword to see, it's okay. Right? We all run to the lifeboats. And we end up in one big lifeboat together. All of us. Right? Now we don't have a lot of fresh water. We have just enough to keep all of us alive for four days. Which is exactly how much time it's going to take for the rescue boats to arrive. Okay? So let me ask you a question. How important is that water? Very critically. Absolutely, right? Are we going to waste any of it? No. Are we going to let anybody wash their hair? No. Are we going to let Bobby wash his hands with the water? No. No. Why not? There's, it's water. There's plenty of it all around us. It's not fresh water. That's right. You see, that water, even though it seems like there's tons of it left, that water is the most valuable resource we have. And wasting even a little bit of it would be careless, irresponsible, and tragic, right? And that's exactly the way we need to start looking at our time, folks. Last week, we talked about some of the wisdom we can learn from the scriptures. In Psalm 90, verse 12, might be the most valuable piece of wisdom we could ever learn. It says, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Teach us to understand how brief life really is 
so that our wisdom grows. Folks, when we truly understand just how short life really is, we will budget our time more effectively than we would without that realization. James 4.14, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. If we think running out of money is the worst thing, just imagine what it would feel like to realize you're at the end of your life and you've wasted decades of time focused on things that don't matter or things that have little value. That's a sad place to be. One of the best quotes I've ever heard was from Baptist minister and Christian missionary to India named William Carey. That's his real Facebook page, by the way. Um, no, it's not true. Don't listen to that. Anyway, Carey said, listen to me. Carey said, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. Mm. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. I don't know about you, but that's terrifying to me. Listen, there are retirement homes all across this country filled with older people who have run out of time. Yeah. And they are furious about it. Yeah. Just go see them. They're at the end of their life. They didn't do anything that they wanted to do, and they're furious. I don't want to end up in that situation, folks. I want to know that I've years, used my years and budgeted my time appropriately. What do you think? Is that something you want? Yeah. Only three of you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, then with this in mind, I want to go through a little exercise tonight on how we use our time each day. Here's what we're going to do. You guys are going to help me, okay? Here's what we're going to do. We are going to list all the things that we do from the moment we get up in the morning until we go to bed at night, okay? And I try not to leave anything out. If we're going to properly budget, we need to be honest about the things we do each day, right? Now, for each thing we do, I'm going to put pennies in this container. Okay. It's not going to be exact, otherwise we'll be here all night, okay? But let's say on average, each penny represents a minute of our time. And we'll just estimate, right? For example, if it takes us two minutes to put on our shoes, we put in two pennies, right? Anybody get it? Yeah. All right, good. Let's go. Let's just say you rolled over. You open your eyes. What's the first thing you do? Turn the alarm off. Turn the alarm off. That doesn't take long. What do you do next? Pick up the phone, right? How long are you on the phone? 10 minutes. Okay. We'll put a few months. Okay. Let the dogs out? Okay. What's that? Go to the bathroom. Me too, brother. I'm right there with you. That takes me a while too. I just Pray. 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 Pray? Pray? How long? Okay. Okay. Say three or four. Okay. What's next? Spend time in silence. Silence. That's something I don't know how to do, brother. Well, I'll put a couple in there for that. What's next? Coffee. 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 Okay. What's next? Shower. Shower. Hygiene. Those of us who are bigger, it takes longer to shower, so we're gonna. Be okay. So hygiene, right? We'll put a couple more in. Well. Breakfast. Well, dressed. get dressed, huh? Devotional. All right, what else? Let the dogs out. Yeah. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I don't care who you are. What's next? Feed the dogs. Feed the dogs? Yeah. What's next? He laughed hard back there. Thank you so much. Get dressed? Okay, what's next? Go to work. Go to work. Okay, how long is your commute? How long is your commute? 30 minutes. 30 minutes, got to put a couple more in. What else? What's next? Put Fox News on. Fox News! Yeah. Okay. All right, Fox News. Got to listen to those guys. What else? Go to work. Go to work. How long is work? Eight hours. Eight hours. Got to let the dogs back in. <laughs> no, the dogs are staying outside. Nobody said let them back in. So. All right, so we go to work. What's next? Make dinner. Make dinner? You're not going to come home first? 
You gotta come home, right? What's next? Let the dogs out. What's next? Feed the dogs. Feed the dogs. What's next? Make dinner. Make dinner. What's next? Go to church. Go to church. Couple. Okay. What else? Shower. What's next? Go to bed. Go to bed. You guys notice what's happening? It's over fall. So, we got a problem, don't we? We're trying to budget too much into each day of our life. Aren't we? It's almost like there aren't enough minutes in the day or hours to do everything we want to do. Yep. Which is exactly why we need to use our time wisely. We need to focus on doing the things that truly matter. Let me ask you another question. How many of those minutes were used for growing our relationship with God or in service to God. I didn't hear anybody say that they did anything. No, I meant out of service. How much time out of our day was budgeted for him? A little bit, right? An hour. An hour? How much of the time we budgeted for him compares to the time we budget for ourselves? One twenty-fourth. If we're lucky, right? Yeah. Now, while you're thinking of those questions, I want you to hear a story from Scripture about a rich man and how he used his time. It's found in Luke 12. Luke 12, 16 through 21. It says, Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Big problem to have. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and all of my goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night then who will get everything you've worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. You know, I couldn't help but notice something while I read that story. It sounds a lot like what we do when we plan for retirement. Doesn't it? We work and we work and we work. Putting our money away into an account each month so that we have plenty for the future. And then when we think we have enough, we retire. Just like the rich man. Eat, drink, and be rich. I know we don't like to think about this, but what if our lives are cut short for some reason? That money doesn't matter much, though, does it? Well, it matters, just not to us. It certainly matters to all those people who are trying to get it after you die. Folks, God tells us to be good stewards of our money, but not to the point where we don't spend it on worthwhile things with the time we have. And what are those worthwhile things? Funny you should ask, because Scripture has an answer. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them. And where thieves break in and steal, store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. This passage is teaching that we should invest our time and our money into things that matter from an eternal perspective. If you think about it, for the most part, we only look at what's temporal. The things that are right in front of us. Right? We don't look at things from an eternal perspective. And God is just the opposite. He sees everything from the eternal viewpoint. And so, 
When you think about it, it's no wonder our priorities are all screwed up. Because we're only thinking about what's in front of us at that time. And there's another problem. You see, we're ADD. All of us are ADD. We have a very short attention span. And we easily get distracted by shiny things or things that move or things that make loud noises. Come to think of it, all those things describe a motorcycle, don't they? <laughs> That's kind of interesting. But I'm serious, folks. We get distracted easily by the things of this world, don't we? And we get pulled into things that don't matter at all. And we waste our time. We spend our money and our precious time on things that don't matter at all in eternity. Not too long ago, our, our Thursday night Bible study went through the book of 1 John. And beginning in verse 13, 1 John, it sounds a lot like our lives today to me. Don't love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. You see, we can't love multiple things with all our heart. It doesn't work that way. For the world offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, a pride in our achievements and our possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you don't have the love of God in you if you love these things. I'm not saying that. The scriptures are saying that. I'm not saying that. You see, only you know what's in your heart. But if we do some soul searching and we find that we are seeking the things of this world more than the things of God, folks, we need to do something. Think about that verse for a moment. Are we in love with the things of this world? Are we craving the physical pleasures that it offers and the things that this world gives to us? Are we focused on our achievements or our possessions? If we are, then we aren't budgeting our time and our resources correctly according to God's word. And look, you guys know this about me. I'm never going to tell you what you should or shouldn't spend your money on. That's up to you. I don't do that. But I will say this. If we are indulging in all kinds of earthly things with our money and the blessings that God's given to us and we are not giving to God, then we are not budgeting our resources correctly. And that's all over the Bible. That's not just me. Proverbs 3.9 Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. The first part of 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you've earned. I don't know about you, but those verses seem pretty clear to me. Sure. Sounds to me like God expects us to give. And not only to give, give the best of what we have. That way we're not tied to our possessions. Our hearts are not attached to our dollars. There's a passage in Malachi 3 that sums up everything about giving very well. It speaks to how when we don't give, we are cheating God. It also talks about the blessings we will receive when we do give. <coughs> Starting in verse 6, it says, I am the Lord and I do not change. I love that. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the day of your ancestors, I have... You have sworn my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we've never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me with the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating Bring all the tithes into the storehouse 
so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. You know, that's the only place in Scripture that I know of where God specifically instructs his people to test him. There are other places where we're warned not to test him. But when it comes to giving, he challenges us to give and to put his promise of financial blessing to the test. Because, folks, you can't outgive God. That's right. And if you ever want to know what I give to the church, ask him. I tell you that because I put my money where my mouth is, literally. Folks, I'm not going to harp on this. Just make sure your faith and your heartstrings are not attached to your finances. Listen to this verse in Proverbs 11, 28. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in the spring. Do you notice how that verse distinguishes between those who trust in their money and those who are godly? From where I stand, it looks to me like this verse is saying that if your faith is in your money, then you cannot be godly. We see that in another place, too. Matthew 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That's enough about that. So I want to ask you one final group of questions. Before I ask them, though, I want you to think for a moment about what you are planning to do with the rest of your life. Right now, what are your plans? Have you guys ever thought about that? How many years you have, what you plan to do from this moment forward. And with that in mind, here's the first question. What do you want to accomplish with the time you have left on earth? Make it hard for people to go to hell. I like that. What do you want to accomplish? Minutes are ticking away. Second question. Do your plans include anything that God may want you to do in your life? Yes. 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 And lastly, with the first two questions in mind, listen to this. Are you budgeting and allocating the resources that God has given you Properly. Yes. yes. Listen to me for a minute. There are a lot of people that claim to be Christian, that claim to have faith, but it's very shallow faith. If we truly believe that God is real, if he's who he says he is, if he is the one who created this world, if he is the one who died on the cross for our sin, then the time and money we spend for his kingdom are the most important investments we could ever make. If it's true, then we need to act like it's true. You see, our actions are what prove our faith. Not our word. Our actions. What we do is what is proof of our faith. Look, I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty about what they've done or they haven't done. And I'm certainly trying not trying to get money for the church. Keep your money if it's that important. Trust me on that. <clears throat> I'm simply trying to get everyone to focus on what's really important before it's too late and we can't do anything about it. Whether you know it or not, budgeting is a biblical principle. 
Do you guys remember what Joseph did in Egypt when God told him about the famine that was coming? Yeah. He stored up food. That's right. He stored up food for the next seven years. He prepared by budgeting their resources, didn't he? And he never would have been able to do it. He would have never been able to save the land of Egypt or of his family if he hadn't prepared. Luke 14. Listen to this. Pretty powerful. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Whoever put up the I for I sort of like, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They'd say, there's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he would send a delegation to discuss terms of peace with the enemy is still far off. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Listen, I don't believe that God is asking us here to give up everything we own. He doesn't want our money. He doesn't want our stuff. And you know what? Everything belongs to him anyway. He doesn't want your old tools in the garage. He doesn't want that broken kite you have in the attic. Folks, he wants us. He wants our heart. And he wants our lives. You see, if he has our hearts and lives, then we will be willing to give up everything we own for him. And so that brings us right back to the beginning of the lesson. How are you budgeting? How are you allocating your time? your money, or any other resources that God's given to you, do you have a plan for the rest of your life? And is what you're planning to do for God's kingdom a part of that plan? Listen to this. This occurred to me as I was finishing up this lesson. Our society puts a lot of thought into end-of-life planning, right? Right? Every time I go to the VA, you have your end of life plan, leave me alone, I just want my meds. Right? That's what I tell them. But we don't seem to put a lot of emphasis on what we will do in the years we have left. Have you noticed that? When you think about it, end of life planning shouldn't just be about what they're going to do with your body or who's going to get your house or your money or your car or your bike. In my opinion, the most important part of end-of-life planning should include what we are going to use the time that we have left for. What do you think? Folks, that brings us to the end of our lesson. Just hang with me in a few minutes as we Close out our service. First, I'm going to quickly and clearly present the gospel message from Scripture. We do that every service. After that, Jen is going to come up. She's going to give everyone a $50 bill. <laughs> okay. That's not going to happen. Jen's going to come up. We're going to pray together over our prayer request. And then after that, I'm going to come back up. I'm going to pray us out. And we're going to be dismissed. Okay? But the most important message of all, and this could definitely work into the rest of your life. Romans 3.23 tells us everybody has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. Every person is a sinner. You know that. I know that. It's not a surprise. If it's a surprise to you, then you need medication. <laughs> Romans 6.23 says, so the wages of sin is death. Spiritual, that's separation from God. 
But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's knowledge. Knowing that God is Jesus in the flesh. But what you do with that knowledge is up to you. You can have a gift, but whether or not you open it is up to you. Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I promise you he's calling you right now. <laughs> God is calling you. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. It doesn't matter what your parents did. It doesn't matter what you did when you were three and you got baptized. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is whether or not we confess Christ as Lord and Savior, believe in our heart, God raised Him from the dead. Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Folks, that's a promise. This life is a vapor. Jed, why don't you come on up? If you guys would just bow your heads, close your eyes for a minute, and I hope you think about what we've presented tonight. What is your plan for the rest of your life? What do you plan to do with the years you have left? What are you doing with your resources? Again, I don't want them. God doesn't need them. He wants you. It's a matter of what we're willing to do for him. How are you using what God has blessed you with to honor and glorify him? John's going to lead us in prayer. Father God, we come to you, Lord. We come to you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. And in this place of peace and honor to you, Father, we come to you with repentant hearts. We come to you knowing that, Lord, you hear our hearts, you know our hearts. Father, in this place, we're going to lift up um, our brothers and sisters and those who are in need right now, Father. So tonight, Lord God, we are lifting up to you praise. We're lifting up praise to you, Father, because you have heard our prayers, and we have many people who have told me tonight that, that you have done um, great things in their lives. So, Father, tonight we start by praising you, Lord Jesus, for um, Lynn Malone, who has come out of her coma, and she is on her way to recovery. Father, we give you all the glory, Jesus. We thank you for that. We continue to pray for a strong and a full and total recovery, God. We um, just pray for Georgia. She's caring for her right now and looking after her. God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. Father, we praise you and we thank you, God, for the move that you're doing in Anne Marie's life. Lord, she is making progress and we give you glory for that. We thank you for every step of progress, every step that's going in the right direction towards healing. We thank you for that. Her liver is doing well. Her kidneys are starting to function. Thank you, God. We pray, God, that her lungs would now be strengthened, that she would be able to eat on her own, that those kidneys would be able to produce and function as you intended them to, God. We thank you for the progress. We thank you for her daughter who has come to, to um, be by her side, God. We just ask for strength for Gary, and we just ask for a full and total recovery, God, just the way that you do this. You, we know that you will do it, God. You're so good. We thank you for that. And Father, tonight we're lifting up to um, Linda. She's going in for neck and back surgery on Tuesday. So we ask you, Father, we, we come and we ask and agree that um, you would guide the doctor's hands, that you would, um, the nurses would be there and attentive, God, that you would give Linda peace as she goes into the surgery, God, that you would um, give her confidence in the doctors that everything would go well, that the surgery would be perfect and that she would have a strong and a quick recovery. Father, we thank you for that. Um, tonight, we're lifting up to you, Lord God, Stig. He has terminal cancer, um, but God, we know that you're a God of miracles, and you've healed cancer in this house before, so we declare heal healing over Stig. God, we declare that he would be healed from cancer. Father, we um, 
pray for Jackie. She's come out of her diabetic coma, but we ask for a full and a total recovery for her, that she would be strengthened, her mind and her body. And God, we pray for Stig and Jackie, for both of them, to know you, Lord Jesus, as Savior. God, through this process, God, that you would turn good out of this, and they would know you, Lord, as Savior. Tonight, we're praying, Lord, for um, spiritual healing in families. Lord, we ask you to heal the wounds of the past, God, that you would bring reconciliation to families right now, um, sons and daughters to their parents, Father, um, sisters and brothers, God, in, in all areas of family, Lord, we ask you for reconciliation and peace. Father, for those that need a financial breakthrough tonight, that they need material um, provision, that there are those that need housing tonight, Jamie still needs a place to live, God. For those who need a job, who are asking you for a better job, for a job, for finances, for income, for a car, battles with car issues, um, housing issues, God, we lift each and every one of those up to you and ask um, uh, Jehovah Jireh to come and move in those situations, God. We ask for a breakthrough for your, um, for your children, Lord. And Father, tonight we are um, praying, God, for the salvation, for the saving grace. Jesus, to touch the hearts of Ian and Kenny and Bree and Bella and Joey and Katie and Brianna and Scott. God, may you draw each one of them closer to you, God, that they would not only know you, Jesus, as Savior, but they would know you as King and as Lord. And for any others who have family members, friends, those who are lost and need Jesus, the prodigals, we call them into the kingdom right now in the name of Jesus. We call them saved, healed, delivered, and set free. We're lifting up to you, God, um, those who are in the Lakeland psych ward, those who are caught up in the occult, those who are caught up in witchcraft and New Age beliefs, those who are battling with mental illness and spiritual warfare for the youth of today, for the young adults for, of today. We declare in the name of Jesus over these individuals that they would be saved, that they would be healed, and that they would be delivered. Um, Jesus, we um, just bind up the lies of the enemy and the traps and the schemes that he would set for these individuals, and we loose the revelation of Jesus Christ to be upon them. We pray for breakthrough in them, that they would know the truth of the word of God, and that they would leave behind the lies and the deception. And we pray it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Folks, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, if you didn't like the jokes that were Bobby, I just want you to know that. Uh, you know, it, it is what it is. But uh, we love you. Hope to see you next Saturday. Have a great week.